Hello students, this is Mrs. Yaud, and today I'm going to teach you Chapter 1, Lesson 5 from Algebra 1. This is about rewriting equations and formulas. Today we're going to start on page 25 of your journals. So for numbers 1 through 6, it asks us to solve the literal equation for y. So the definition of a literal equation is that it's an equation with two or more variables. These first six problems are really important that you do know how to solve for them because they will help you with when you're graphing lines. And we're going to be graphing lines really soon in this class. So these right here are probably the most important part of this lesson. So when you are solving a literal equation for a variable, what you need to do is draw your line and then circle the variable that you want to solve for. In this case, we're solving for y. So I'm going to circle the y. So that means that what I need to get rid of is the minus 2x. So the opposite of subtracting 2x would be to add it. So I'm going to add 2x to both sides of the equation. But I have to be really careful here because uh, what I have left is y on this side. Now, am I allowed to combine these two together? Well, 15 doesn't have an x to it. And so these are not like terms, which means what we need to do is keep them separated when we write our answer. So we could either write 15 plus 2x, and that's a fine answer. But one thing that I want you to get used to is writing it in y equals mx plus b form. So that would be writing the 2x first. And the reason why this is a little bit better is because it helps you when we're doing equations of the lines. So remember, equation of the line is y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope of the line and b is the y-intercept of the line. You should have learned about this last year. If this were a test or a quiz, I would accept either of these answers, but I'm happier when students write it in y equals mx plus b form because it helps to prepare you for graphing of lines. All right, let's take a look at number three. So number three, I'm going to draw my line and I'm going to circle what I want to solve for. So I want to solve for 5y. So what I'm going to do is I need to get rid of that 8. So I'm going to subtract it off and move it to the other side. Now notice where I put that 8. I put it with what I can combine it with. Since a does not, 8 does not have an x uh, and 2 does not have an x, that is what I can combine together. So now we have these two cancel, and then on the left we have 5x minus 10 equals 5y. So now we need to get rid of this 5. 5 is being multiplied by the y, so I need to do the opposite, which is divide. So what I tell my students is you can either divide the whole thing by 5, but it's actually a little bit better if you divide each part by 5 instead. And the reason is, is because 5x minus 10 all over 5, you can think about it like the distributive property. You know how when you have um, a distributive like 5 multiplied by 5x minus 10 and you have to distribute that in? Same thing is true here. When you have the whole thing divided by 5, or by any number, you have to distribute it and use it for both. So what I find is that if students don't separate it out, what happens is a lot of times they'll just do one piece of it. Like maybe they'll only do the 5x over 5, or they will only do the negative 10 divided by 5. And so in order to avoid that confusion and avoid that mistake, my suggestion is to just separate it out into two different parts. It will be a whole lot better for you. So now then 5 over 5, these two cancel to a 1. So I have x and then 10 divided by 5 is 2. So x minus 2 equals y. Uh, if you wanted to write it as an equation of the line y equals mx plus b, you would write it as y equals x minus 2 instead. Okay, so that's acceptable as well. All right, let's take a look at number 5. So I'm going to draw my line and circle my variable. 
Okay, so now I have to move my uh, 3x over by subtracting it off. And once again, these two terms on the right are not like terms, so we're going to keep them separate. Now notice that you still have a negative here in front of the y, so you don't want to miss that. A lot of people will accidentally write it uh, without that negative, and so they forget that that's something else that you need to do. So this negative out front, remember, is kind of like an invisible negative 1. So that means I divide by negative 1. And just like on number 3, I'm going to do that for both parts because I have to distribute it into p the both pieces. So then my answer is y is equal to positive 3x plus 4. And that's already written as y equals mx plus b, so we'll call that done. Okay, I would like for you to please do numbers 2, 4, and 6. Pause the video, turn it back on, and see how you did. All right, check your answers for numbers 2, 4, and 6. If you got them incorrect, please see if you can find your mistakes. Okay, in exercises 7 through 12, this time we're solving the literal equation for x, not for y. So I'm going to draw my line, and I'm going to circle my x. And I've got two of them over here, so that means I'm going to combine them together first. So that would be y is equal to 6x. Now I still need to solve for x. So that means I need to get rid of the 6. And how do we do that? We divide it out. So I'm going to divide out 6 on both sides. And so my answer is y over 6 is equal to x. All right, number 8. So this time we're going to solve for x again. So I'm going to circle it. Now this one's a little bit tricky because we cannot combine these two together. The only way that we can solve for x on this is to use the opposite of the distributive property. And it's the way the name for that is factoring. So what we're going to do is I'm going to write q is equal to. Um, I have to pull the x out. So I'm going to pull it out and see what's left. So if I pulled it out, this would what would be first would be just the 3. I don't know why I put a comma there. Let me erase that. It would be just the 3. And then what's left over for the second part is 9z. OK, let's think about that and make sure we did that right. Let's uh, multiply this back in. x multiplied by 3, that is 3x. Excellent. OK, we did that. Excellent. Get it? I said x and x. Never mind. OK, now we're going to go x multiplied by 9z. And that does indeed equal 9xz. OK, so. I have my x pulled out. The reason why I want to do that is because, remember, my goal is to solve for x. And so right now, x is being multiplied by the entire quantity of 3 plus 9z. So that means if it's multiplied by the entire quantity, the opposite of multiplication, you guessed it, division. So if I divide out 3 plus 9z on both sides, then we will have our answer. So that would be q over 3 plus 9z is equal to x. So now we have the x all by itself. That one was a little tricky. OK, let's take a look at number 9. So number 9, we're going to draw our line, circle our x's. Once again, I can't combine those two together because they're not like terms. So I'm going to do the same kind of thing like what I did on number 8, but first, I need to get rid of this plus 4. So my first step then will be to subtract 4 on both sides. OK, and that means we'll have r minus 4. And then on the right, we'll have 7x minus sx. Now, we're going to do the same thing like what we did on number 8. In order to solve for x here, I need to pull it out. I need to factor it out, do the opposite of distributive property. So r minus 4 is equal to, pull out that x, and I'm going to be left with 7 minus s. OK, so now the x is out by itself. And the only thing left that I need to do is to divide by the 7 minus s on both sides. And that's going to be my answer. So we have r minus 4 
over 7 minus s, I have to write super tiny, equals x. And there is my answer. OK, number 10. So number 10, uh, I need to solve for x. And so I notice that I have an x here and I have an x here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull all of my x's onto the left side and everything else I'm going to move over to the right. So that means that I want to subtract 10x. And notice that I'm putting it under the 4x because they are like terms. At the same time, I'm going to move my y over because that is in my way. OK, so now we have on the left negative 6x. And on the right, we cannot combine these two together. So I'm going to keep them separate. 6 minus y. Oh, sorry, negative 6. I've got to keep that negative with the 6. OK, now we are almost done. X needs to be solved for, so we need to divide by negative 6. Once again, remember, we got to do it on all the parts, just like we did above. So those cancel, and we're left with x is equal to, OK, so negative 6 over negative 6 is positive 1, and negative y over negative 6 is positive y over 6. And there is my answer. OK, number 11. Let's go ahead and circle the x that we need to solve for. And that means we need to get rid of that 2r. So what I'm going to do first is move the 2r over by subtracting it. It looks like I can combine it with the r on that side. So we have 4g minus 1r, or just r, equals negative 2x. OK, almost done. We need to solve for x. So I need to divide out that negative 2. And I'm just going to leave it as is. Now, I could divide it out on each part. Let's go ahead and do that. So we'll go divide by negative 2, divide by negative 2. Keep, keep it like what we were doing. So now we have 4 divided by negative 2 is negative 2g. And then this would be plus r over 2 is equal to x. OK, last one in this set. I'm going to have you try number 12 on your own and see if you can get it right. OK, I got 4 thirds z minus 4 thirds. Now, if you decided to write it as 4z minus 4 all over 3 is equal to x, I would accept that as well. OK, in exercises 13 through 16, we want to solve the formula for the indicated variable. So in number 13, we want to solve for b. So I'm going to circle my b. Now we have a couple of things going on here. Um, my suggestion is to get rid of that fraction first by multiplying by the reciprocal. So that would be 2 over 1 or just 2. So I'm going to multiply by 2 on both sides. And what I get is 2a is equal to bh because the half and the 2 over 1 cancel now. All right, so I still need to solve for b. So my last step is to divide out the h. And so my answer is b is equal to 2a over h. All right, let's take a look at number 14. This is a volume of a cone, and we need to solve for h again. So I'm going to do the same thing like what I did in number 13. I'm going to multiply by the fraction, the, the inverse of the fraction, and then divide out what I don't need. I'm going to let you try number 14 on your own, because it's very similar to number 13. OK, check your work. I got h equals 3v over pi r squared. Number 15 is a continuation of the previous page's uh, direction. So we need to solve for r. And r is on the denominator. So this one's a little bit on the tricky side. We need to get it out from the denominator, because that's a, that's a bad place for it to be when we want to solve for it. So I'm going to multiply by r just to move it out from the denominator. And when I do that, I get r multiplied by i is equal to v. OK, so now I have r on the denominator. So that will be a little bit easier. So now that we just need to move the i over, so I'm going to divide by i on both sides. And we end up getting that r is equal to v over i. OK, number 16, we want to solve for r. So I'm going to circle that. That means you need to get rid of the n and the t. I'm going to see if you can figure this one out on your own. OK, I got r equals pv over nt. 
Last problem, number 17. The amount A of money in an account after simple interest has been earned is given by this formula, where P is the principal, R is the annual interest rate in decimal form, and T is the time in years. So first they want us to solve the formula for R. So I'm going to circle the R, and my first step would be to subtract off that P on both sides. So I'm going to have A minus P is equal to PRT. Now we need to solve, continue solving for R, so we need to divide out PT. And since this is a formula, I'm just going to go ahead and keep it uh, over the whole thing, just because it's a little bit easier to write that way. So then we get R is equal to A minus P over PT. If you wanted to separate it out, you could. In that case, you would say R is equal to A over PT minus, and then we have P over PT, but these two cancel, so then that would be A over PT minus 1 over T. So that's a different way to write that same formula. Okay, let's take a look at number B. It says the amount of money in the account after interest has been earned is that, um, and the principal is 1,000, time is two years, what is the annual interest rate? So they, we already solved for R, so then we can use this formula that we just did and just plug all of our numbers in. So our annual interest rate is A. A would be 1,080, that's the amount, uh, minus P, the principal, which is 1,000, over the principal, which is 1,000, multiplied by t, or time, which is two years. So uh, that's going to be 80 over 2,000. And I can simplify this, and I can divide by 8, and I get 1 over 25. And since this is supposed to be, though, as a rate, as a percentage, 1 over 25 is the same as 0 0.04. And so that means that it has a 4% interest rate. Okay, our letter C asks us to solve this formula for P. So if you remember, we have this in two different spots. We can't combine those terms together, so the best way that we can solve for this is to use the opposite distributive property and pull it out. So we're going to keep our A, we're going to pull out the P. And so what we're left with, when we pull out the P from this one, it's actually, it doesn't disappear, it becomes a 1. And then when we pull it out of the other one, it's RT. Now let's see if that makes sense. P multiplied by 1 is P. Do you see how that works? P multiplied by RT is PRT. So yep, there it is. Okay, so now we're going to divide, we still need to solve for P, so we need to divide out my 1 plus RT on both sides. And my answer is going to be that P is equal to A over 1 plus RT. And there is my final answer. Okay, thanks for watching.